Life is unfair. This became the running motif in Famisha's life, because in her world, people received magic blessings at the age of five. Blessings ranked by number of stars, with five stars being the highest and most coveted in their society. She was blessed with the skill to tame monsters, only with zero stars, a completely and utterly worthless rank, as she couldn't even tame small, meekly animals. The acceptance in the village she grew up in became rejection. The love she received from her parents became hate. She was forced to flee from her hometown while being chased by bounty hunters employed by her village. She changes her name to Ivy to take on a new identity. She cuts her hair so she can pass as a boy to avoid the hunters. She hasn't given up on life because there is something special about her. She was reincarnated from our world into the girl she is now, and the voice of her past gives her advice on how to live and who to be. She eventually meets a tiny slime who she befriends named Sora. And now the weakest duo is on a quest to reach the capital, where she's been told she'll receive the purpose she's been missing. This is a heartfelt tale of the weakest tamer began a journey to pick up trash. So let's get started and watch the story unfold. We see Ivy as she runs into the forest. She sets up pots and pans to clang in the trees when someone comes by. She pulls some hidden bags out from a secret area that only she knows about and stares with a look of wonder as they get sucked into one of the bags. She straps all the bags onto herself and packs in other various items. As she walks out with all of her wares, she says to herself she gave up on happiness a long time ago, being an unwanted child who was cast away by her parents. She tries to test the blade she's holding but ends up tumbling and rolling backwards. If only she had important skills like running or hiding, but if she did, then of course, none of this would have happened to her in the first place. She wonders if she had done something in her past life to have been cursed so badly in this one. She slides down the hill, happy to find a dumping ground. She tugs on a bag handle from the dumpster to almost get pierced by several thrown away spears. Inside of a bag, she's delighted to find a new jacket and a mat that might make her journey easier. But even with the positive outlook, she has intrusive thoughts to remind her she's just an unwanted child living off of trash like a hobo. Ivy then sees a man who is a monster tamer. He whistles to call in slimes to feed on the trash and as she watches them melt the garbage away, she wonders if her past life would have thought of monsters as cute. She runs away to hide as the man comes towards the back of the dumpster. She stares completely frightened as the man mentions there's a bounty on this little girl's head, where the head of her village wants her back dead or alive. She flees further, having restless nights, and while crossing a marsh, a strong gust blows and she finds dozens of slimes jumping around her. She runs away with them chasing after, she makes it to the forest and stumbles backwards with more slimes appearing before, falling down a cliff with her fall broken by the branches of a large tree. She heals herself with some potions, hoping the chase on her has ended. She then makes it to some beautiful stream water, where she dives in to bathe. Afterwards, she cuts her hair and puts on clothes to disguise herself as a boy, staring out into the water, ready to begin her new life. She comes upon a tiny slime on a leaf that she actually finds cute. Then, when she goes through her monster compendium, it turns out to be extremely rare, only being known as the weakest slime with a disintegrating existence. She can't help but rejoice because the slime is just as weak and useless as she is. Finally, someone for her to relate to. A small breeze blows, dragging the small slime away, and looking at the compendium again, Ivy learns the slime can disappear from even a heavier gust or even the slightest touch as she stares at it being stuck or merely being put upside down. Ivy gently puts the slime right side up using both her hands and learns from the book that it's likely this slime will die within a day, making the slime very sad. Then the wind blows a blade of grass that knocks over the weak, useless slime, and Ivy chases after it, barely catching the slime before it falls in the water. She then spends her time with the slime as much as possible before its inevitable disintegration. She talks to it, mentioning her thoughts on how gods don't play fair. They make people who are happy, but also people who are miserable like her in this slime. The humans in this world known as Ortogas all receive skills when they turn 5 years old. Her father has 2 star carpentry skills, her mother has 2 star needlework and 1 star mending skills. However, no one knows what kind of skills they receive or how many stars they'll be in value until they appear. But everyone's future is decided by those skills and the number of stars. At the age of 5, Ivy received the taming skill, which is the ability to tame monsters and win them over. But sadly, she was born starless, a tamer who cannot tame a single monster, useless and outcasted by society. And her family, they stopped giving 
losing her food and a house to sleep in, she slowly found herself with no place to belong. However, she does have one thing that others don't, memories of her past life. She's apparently a human who was reincarnated here from a different world, but most of the memories come hazy and tend not to be of much use either. They often even whisper things to her she doesn't quite understand, like proverbs. The only person who was still nice to Ivy was the fortune teller. She had given Ivy books that taught her many different things, and even this magic bag that can store many items. But unfortunately, the fortune teller died recently, so there's no one left in this world for Ivy. And everyone from the village is trying to find and kill her, even though she had done nothing wrong. Is being starless that bad? Is it something that she should truly be hated for? Is the world rejecting Ivy's very existence? She then stares at the slime, remarking on how it's fated to disappear within a single day. The world just isn't fair. The next morning, she wakes up, scurrying to find the little slime, saddened by the only thing she could relate to, disappearing. Even though she thought she was used to being lonely, she couldn't help but tear up. She starts going through her bags, remembering how the fortune teller told her to march towards the royal capital. Then, when she checks her map, she's relieved to find the slime still alive. She learns from her compendium that in order to tame a monster, she must first give it some of her magical energy. If the monster accepts it, it'll begin to glow, and the monster must then receive a name during that phase. She wonders if she can really do this, being starless and all. She then imbues the slime with magic and gives it the name Sora, meaning sky to represent the blue sky above her. With the name being a success, she's excited to journey with her cute little friend, embracing her own name of Ivy, the plant that thrives even when it's stomped on. The next day, a mouse wanders in a little contraption. It's the tenth one that Ivy's caught. She's overjoyed to have field mice for a meal tonight. She wraps the mice in some leaves and stores them in her bag for later. She points on her map to where she currently is, the area of her hometown, Latomi Village, and notes that the royal capital is way further on the left past this map. So she wants to stop in the town of Tola before the map cuts off. She has to catch Sora again before the breeze blows him away. She then gets startled by some scurrying and decides to run up a tree to hide. And she's horrified to see a large herd of huge ants but they don't notice her at all. After they leave, she holds up Sora, wondering if he seems a little bigger. And after noticing she's got a cut on her cheek, she heals herself with some potions, but can't help but think that she should have more potions and wonders where the rest went. As she wanders, she sees a wanted poster with her face on it. She notices the reward is 500 Dao, which is a big reward where they're from. She wonders why she could be worth so much, and her past self whispers that it's because she's a wanted fugitive, which doesn't make Ivy any happier since it makes her sound like a villain. She goes to take a second wanted poster down, and is flabbergasted to see their ugly depiction of her, and it makes her pretty mad so she rips it up. However, when seeing her beautified one, she remarks, yeah, this one, it's probably me. But somehow, it seems Sora may disagree. They finally arrive in the next town, with Ivy feeling a little envious over all the townsfolk and their everyday magic. She sees a butcher shop and thinks about selling her field mice for some cash. She gets nervous and decides to walk away, but the butcher comes over as he can smell the mice due to his own level 2 odor skill. He has Ivy show him the mice and is excited over the fresh cuts of meat. He buys them for 100 dao, explaining that most people are bringing him bigger game these days, so he'd be happy to buy the smaller meats from Ivy at any time. With a pocket full of cash, Ivy gets a little hungry looking at the bread shop, but she's too nervous so she walks away at first. But then she comes back, with the shop owner asking what she would like to buy. Ivy asks what she can afford with 100 Dao, as it turns out she's never used money before. So the owner explains Ivy could buy the entire shelf of bread with 100 Dao. She then decides to buy a couple things and takes off happily with the delicious treats. That evening, she sits atop a tree, very eager to eat. Then, she splits off half for Sora. As she enjoys herself, she learns that Sora can't eat the bread, but she can't comprehend what he might like eating at all. The next day, she is overjoyed to find a mound of trash. She comes upon baskets of potions, but they're all expired and discolored. But when she sets them down, Sora finds a use by absorbing the potion bottles whole. This surprises Ivy, because absorbing inorganic material is usually a skill only held by high-level rare slimes. She decides to test this with another piece of trash, but it seems Sora is only interested in potion bottles. But not red ones, just blue potion. They continue their days in the village, with Ivy bringing more mice meat to the butcher to make money and buying more bread to enjoy, then bathing in the nearby river every day. 
As they eat their meals for the day, Ivy wishes she could stay in the village forever. The people here treat her nice. Unlike the memories of her father who discarded her like the trash she's become more endearing of. The next day, she heads into the village and when she sees some adventurers, she thinks of the man who was hunting her for a bounty and she runs away. She runs past the butcher who is eager to buy some mice, but she becomes frightened to see her wanted poster on the shop's stall. She then runs to the bread shop where the bread lady baked her favorite bread to give her some. However, Ivy runs away again, feeling worse after seeing a second poster. She cries that night because she knows she must leave the village that's been treating her so well, and embraces Sora who keeps her company while she sleeps. The next day when she ventures out, she comes to crossroads, unsure of where to go. She decides to go grab a bite to eat since she was too scared to pick up supplies in the town. She's delighted to come upon a golden apple tree, but now isn't so happy to see it's a monster that feasts on adventurers. Ivy tries to flee but scrapes by with a vicious attack on her wrist. Then with Ivy lying on the ground, ready to pass out from the pain, Sora begins to light up and Ivy can't help but think, that's right, slimes eat people as well. We see a man carving wood. He hears a baby crying, so runs upstairs to the midwife holding their healthy little baby girl. The man's wife, Fulfei, asks him what name he should give her. He responds, for Misha, as the baby giggles, embraced by the love of the mother at her bedside. A few years later, Misha would grow into a kind and wonderful girl, bringing her father and older brother lunch as they worked hard for their family. As the three enjoyed their tasty bread lunch, Fermisha nearly choked from eating too fast, so her father used his magic to fill her cup with water so she could clear her throat properly. Even though her brother would scold her, Fermisha would continue to eat wildly, claiming it's because she's a growing girl, which caused her father to laugh. His family brought him so much joy. That evening, Fermisha would come home to her mother and older sister, Vasilla, preparing dinner. Her brother, Feton, teased her for saying she better start being able to use everyday magic. So Fermisha retorted that she'll definitely be able to soon, with her mother gently reminding her that everyone develops at their own pace. And even without magic, Fermisha is already admirably helping out as much as she can. However, Vasilla comments that's not what their mom said to her when she was four years old. She was being told by their mother every day to hurry up and be able to use magic already, with the mother applying huh? Is that really how it was? Parents, am I right? Dinner is set for the family to enjoy. A big stew was the main course. The father proudly explains that since Vasilla has the soothing skill, the food is enhanced with the ability to cure fatigue. Then the family enjoys their peaceful dinner together. The family continues to work on things throughout the evening. The father mentions the house he'd been building should be finished by the end of the month, but he couldn't complete it without his lovely family that was truly blessed in this world. Their son Fetan made the furniture with his three-star furniture making skills, and the mother helped with the furniture cushions using her two-star sewing skills. Their family was truly blessed with talent for the homemaking business. As the mother worked, a tear came to her eye, which startled Fermisha. Turns out, the mother had been stitching bridal wear for the shoemaker's daughter, and this made her realize that Fermisha and her older sister Priscilla will be married off someday too. Priscilla is eager to have a beautiful dress, while the father says it's too soon. But no, the mother knows the time always comes faster than you'd expect. After all, Fermisha is almost five years old, which makes Fermisha excited for birthday presents. However, there's something even more important coming that day, her skill. The father remarks that as long as a person has a skill, they'll always find a place to work. The mother adds, what sort of skill and how many stars? No one knows until they receive their skills from the gods. The type of skill and number of stars will determine where you work, where someone like the older brother Feton, who has three star skills is highly desired. Unlike Vasilla, who is only one star, which he constantly teases her for. The mother then asks Fermisha what skill she'd like. From very early on, Fermisha had always wanted to be a tamer, to befriend dragons, griffins, and all sorts of monsters, causing her brother to laugh as he felt her reasoning to be ridiculous. The father reminded Fermisha that skills are bestowed by the gods so its people can live in this world, causing Fermisha to pout since he also told her it's not for her to make friends with monsters. However, he handed her a horse he made with his two-star carpentry skills in order to cheer her up. The family hears a knock on the door. Who could it be at this hour? Turns out, it's Mistress Luba, the fortune teller. She showed up because it's nearly time for Fermisha to be gifted with her skill and has come to offer prayer of good fortune. The fortune teller then thinks back to when Fermisha was much younger. The mother had been concerned because Fermisha started speaking incredibly well since the age of two and that sometimes Fermisha would say strange things. The mother couldn't help but feel concerned, wondering 
wondering if her daughter would be able to use magic someday. Promisha then suddenly burst out. Magic? This world has magic? Something that Luba affirms to little Famisha. Famisha jumps with joy, then says, what? Reincarnated into another world, which leaves the mother concerned over the strange words her daughter had just spoken. Luba then reassures the mother, it's fine. Famisha will grow into a very intelligent child. Luba then makes an excuse so the mother can step away for a second. That way, she can privately inquire about Famisha. She tells Famisha that if people learn she has memories of her past life, things will become difficult for her. So she mustn't tell anyone about them. She must keep it a secret, even from her own mother. Back in the present, Luba tells the family Famisha is sure to be gifted with a wonderful skill. Vasila wonders if Foresight tells Luba what skill Famisha will get. However, with Luba's skill being only one star, she can't see quite that far. Fetan then mocks Luba's one star, causing the father to scold his bratty son. After all, without her predictions, the village wouldn't know when they'd be able to harvest the Zaro fruit. We finally reach the day of Famisha's fifth birthday. Her parents sit with her as the village priest says to them, Today is the day to receive her blessings from God. Blessings that will grant her the joy of hard work, happiness at the wonder of living, and divine protection of truth. Famisha walks up to touch the sacred water. Then the priest uses his magic to receive the divine message. Famisha is blessed with the tamer skill, the ability to win monsters over to her, which got both her and her parents excited. This was going exactly how Famisha wished. However, this dream would become a nightmare, as the priest gave a very disturbed look at the reading. The water burst before them, meaning this child possesses a starless tamer skill. Her parents protested. Her father shouted, This must be some kind of mistake. My daughter couldn't possibly be starless. But the priest assured him, This is a divine message. Mistakes simply aren't possible, and that any further talk like this is blasphemy. As the priest walked away, muttering under his breath that this girl has been abandoned by the gods, Formisha hears a whisper from her past life, saying, This is an impossibly hard mode video game. Back at home, the family sits completely depressed and disheveled. The father slams the table, having been drinking non-stop. The mother tells him he's had too much, but he ignores her, wondering how this could all have possibly happened. Both him and his wife have stars. Their oldest son and daughter have stars. Why does Famisha have none? Famisha tries to ask him something, but he shouts back at her, telling her not to speak because the starless have been abandoned by the gods. He truly questioned how a starless could be born in his family, which made Famisha stare in disbelief, with the man before her no longer having the love and warmth provided she had always known. Fulfei tells him he's going too far as he quickly gets up. He grabs the wooden horse he gave to Famisha and slams it on the ground, shouting, what's the point of being a tamer if she has no stars? He wonders if Famisha is even really his daughter, and with these harsh words, Fulfei falls to the ground in tears. Famisha tries to console her mother, but Fetan grabs her, shouting not to touch his mom. Famisha tries to ask her older sister for help, but Facilla only gives her a nasty look. With Famisha screaming that her brother is hurting her, begging him to stop, he throws her on the ground and yells at her to get out. She looks back at him, completely lost in everything that's transpired, but then she runs out the door. Famisha then walks through the village like a lifeless zombie, all while the villagers speak in hushed whispers about the starless child abandoned by God. The village head announces the appearance of a starless to be a horrible omen of disaster. He tells the villagers they must prepare against the misfortunes and devote their abilities to the good of the village. As Famisha watches them, the other kids in the village throw rocks at her, causing her to bleed. She runs, only to be faced with more villagers staring at her with hateful eyes. She ran all night through a forest to get away from them, wondering why this was happening until she tripped. She can't go home anymore. Her past self whispers there's going to be a witch hunt which makes Famisha clench her fist as it rains. She says to herself, she's not a witch. As she wanders in the rain depressed and cold, she thinks to herself, she's getting hungry too. She comes across some berries and eats what she can, but still shivers from the sopping cold. She breaks a stick and tries to use magic for the first time to make a fire, but it goes out. As she tries to light it a second time, she suddenly passes out. She wakes up to the fortune teller who helped warm her with the fire and prepared food to eat. Luba tells Famisha it seems she has less magical energy than most people and that if she ever runs out, it will put her life at risk. She then tells Famisha that her foresight skill showed this was going to happen to her, just not the way it was going to happen. But she never imagined Famisha to be starless as she hands food over for Famisha to enjoy. After dinner, she hands a magic bag to Famisha, and even though it's an older model, it will still be able to fit a lot of things in it, and also books with knowledge about various useful things. Luba then says Famisha is destined to take a journey to see the world and broaden her perspective, that she must head to a town neighbor 
neighboring the royal capital and find people that she can trust, and that when she does, she must tell them everything, even that she's a starless. That way, she can find true friends who will accept her no matter what. As Hermesha learns various skills from Luba, she asks why Luba doesn't hate her like the rest of the village. Luba explains that long ago, no one had skills or stars, but still worked and lived happily. So not having skills isn't a bad thing, even though she doesn't know how things ended up like this. Three years later, we find Famisha in front of a huge trash pile. She wonders if the planks are left over from her older brother Phaeton's furniture making, storing some away to use for firewood later. She then stares at some potions, which are used but still enough to be stored away for later. She got a huge haul today. She catches a mouse and enjoys a skewer from it afterwards. She thinks it's been a while since she'd last seen the fortune teller and wonders what she's doing. She then senses the presence of people coming and puts her fire out and hides to see two men from the village. She has a bad feeling and wants to know why people are coming after her, so she decides to spy on them in town. She hears two women talk about how it was a shame that Luba had died from sickness recently, which surprised her. She sees her father report to the village head that he still hasn't been able to find Fermisha, and the village head remarks that Fermisha must have caught wind of what they were trying to do. The head tells Fermisha's father that Starless only bring misfortune, and her father agrees, saying Starless should not be allowed to exist in this world. This broke her emotionally, hearing the words from the same man that used to love her, causing her to fall into despair. She even imagines her mother saying, it would have been better if she'd never been born. The head of the village talks about the sad loss of their village fortune teller, saying the cause of her death was none other than the curse of the Starless, and that because Luba ignored his warnings and looked after Fermisha, she also became forsaken by the gods. They cannot afford to leave Fermisha unchecked, as their village will one day be struck by calamity, and then he commands them all to capture and kill her. Fermisha shrunk in fear at the harsh bounty being placed on her life. She ran as the villagers chased after her, with her mother restraining her. As her father delivered the finishing blow, she woke up under the stars, remembering that Sora was going to eat her. She then stares back at the sky and peacefully accepts her fate, because she's an unwanted child anyways. Next, she finds herself awakened by Sora nudging her. He bounces on top of her, and that's when Fermisha notices her wound is completely healed. She thanks him as she learned he wasn't trying to eat her. He was actually just healing her. And this is when he began to speak. So Fermisha rejoices and laughs at her little slime that can only say poo poo. She may be an unwanted child, but none of that matters as long as she has him. So maybe she'll decide to live just a little longer. Another day comes and we see Ivy resting peacefully. A droplet of morning dew falls and hits Sora, waking him up. He spams his poo poo phrase over and over again, like an alarm clock. So Ivy grabs him to turn him off. Of course, she would have no idea what that even is in this world, but her past life does. She pets the energetic little Sora on this fine morning, and she cheers, eager for the two of them to continue their journey. Berries and blue potions, Ivy prays to say gratitude for the fine morning meal. The two enjoy themselves, but Ivy is surprised at how much energy her little slime seems to have now. She grabs him close and remarks on how much sturdier he is than before. Is this really the same disintegrating slime that she knew? Maybe he's grown after consuming all of those blue potions. Well, none of that really matters, as long as he's healthy. Ivy begins to think about the next village they'll be entering. She's been low on meat supplies since leaving the last village, so she'll need to hunt more mice to sell. But her past self tells her if she cooks the mice she catches, she'll actually save more money. Which would be a good idea, except the smell of food would eventually attract monsters. So even with a higher cost, buying dry meat from the store is safer. Then suddenly, Sora keeps shouting his phrase over and over. He's finished all the potions and he wants even more, leaving Ivy to wonder what she's going to do. Well, if you were all wondering what's next, allow me to remind you the name of the anime. Ivy is excited to find a large pile of trash. She starts digging through, hoping to find Sora some food but instead gets distracted by the hand-me-down. She remembers she needs to stay on track, so she looks around some more and finds a big pile of used potions. Comparing the blue potions, this one looks new, and this one looks a little too old. But the age of the blue potion doesn't matter to Sora, he'll eat them all. He then consumes a red one, something he wouldn't consume before. So she tries testing a green potion that acts as a painkiller, and a purple potion that removes curses, but Sora doesn't want either of those ones. Her past self then advises her to try mixing the colors, so she combines red and blue to make the limitless purple. Uh, I mean, purple potion. 
and Sora eats that too. However, he wants nothing to do with a regular purple potion. They then head on their way with Sora bouncing and rolling around, and Ivy is so happy because she thought she'd always travel alone, always live alone, but now she'll always have Sora. She gets excited to see some berries and gushes over the delicious taste. She tries to offer some to Sora, but he isn't too excited. Later that evening, the two enjoy dinner, but Sora eats potions non-stop, all the way to the point that Ivy is concerned she won't have any potions left for herself. So her past self gives the advice, if you're sleeping, you can't be eating. Ivy takes the advice to heart, and atop a tree branch, she begins to tell Sora a bedtime story, her favorite one from when she was little. Long, long ago, the world was at war. One day, the king gathered together magicians who could see the future and had them all make predictions about how the war would end. The future they saw was the end of the world, a truly terrifying sight. The magicians discussed their visions, and then, in order to protect the world, they cast powerful magic. No one knows what that magic was, and no one can use it now. The only one who can is a child who comes from another world, as it's a forgotten magic. Magic that is vast and scary and quiet, lonely and untouchable, Dewdrop falls again, waking up Sora like the little alarm he is, so Ivy pats him to make him stop. However, she gets upset with herself waking up to find Sora had already eaten all of her potions. She nabs some mice in a mouse trap. Just kidding, she accidentally catches a big snake. She's reluctant to deal with it, but she knows it might still fetch her some money if she sells it, so she grabs a cloth from her magic bag and covers the snake, confining it with a knot. Walking through a path, she smells something burning while Sora freaks out over it. She's curious as to what it is and decides to check it out, only to see a caravan that had been completely wrecked by some bandits. She decides to hide Sora in her bag, and when she looks in further, she's horrified to find some men who'd been bloodied and battered. No way bandits would do this. This had to be the work of monsters. Ivy decides to make a run for it until she's far away, panting and completely out of breath. She spots Letum and makes her way into town. And even though she's safe now, she feels like she has to tell someone. She spots the sign for a town hall, and even though she's nervous, she enters. The people from town hall ask the little boy, Ivy, what she's got there. She tells them it's a snake she caught, but that's not important. Ivy then tells them about the people she found passed out on the way here, the cart that was on fire, and the people who had been attacked and didn't survive. A man walks up to Ivy to get a better account of what had happened, hoping the attackers were only bandits. But after hearing about how the horses were also killed instead of stolen, he reluctantly agrees it was most likely a monster attack. The man then tells everyone to locate the monsters as soon as possible, and he thanks Ivy, explaining she'll be rewarded as soon as the monsters are found. And the woman explains, in this town, people are rewarded for giving monster tip-offs to town hall. It's to give the town countermeasures, before people can get hurt. The woman gives Ivy a document to claim her reward once the task has been completed. Ivy then goes to sell the snake she caught, and the buyer tells her it's a rare female and offers to give her three giddle. Ivy has to count, and has since learned the value is equivalent to 300 dao, or selling 30 field mice. She walks out happy with her collected money, and now's the time to find food for Sora. She, of course, heads to another dump, and becomes so happy as she finds over 21 magic bags. She's at first concerned, unsure of how she can carry them all, so she starts trying to fill the magic bags with each other. Then, she starts organizing them, with bags on the left unable to carry other magic bags, followed by magic bags that can carry one magic bag, then magic bags that can carry two magic bags, and all the way on the right, magic bags that can carry three magic bags. She eventually finishes organizing them and heads back into town to buy more potions. The man from earlier greets her and thanks her as they were able to verify the monster tip right away. Turns out the monsters were ogres and an ogre king based on the tracks they had found. They ended up sending high-ranked adventurers to go slay them and no one is to leave the village until the monsters have been defeated. He then tells Ivy to head to town hall and collect her reward. And after handing in her document, the town hall lady hands her over five giddle. Oh wow. The snake was worth 3 giddle, or 30 mice. At 5 giddle, that's 50 mice's worth. But it's not over, as she's also awarded 2 ladol. 1 ladol is 10 giddle, so altogether she's collected 280 field mice worth of money. Later that night, she chills for the evening, eating berries and feeding Sora in her bag. She'll have to stay in town until the monster hunt is over. 
but she's happy regardless. With Sora still at her side, she decides to rest for the night. On this nice morning, we turn to Ivy finding one of her rat catching traps broken, wondering if a bigger animal had stepped on and snapped it. This leaves Ivy concerned that she won't catch anything to sell for money. Her past self reminds Ivy of the tip reward she got for reporting the goblin attack the other day. So she opens her bag thinking she might be okay for a little while, but she'd rather save it for a rainy day. Sora then spots something and begins to move. Ivy has to chase after him. It's faint, but Ivy can also sense something. It's the smell of blood? The two enter past a brush, and Ivy is astonished to see an injured beast. She's unsure of what it is, but senses magical energy within it. She opens her monster compendium and learns it's called an Adondala. It's an incredibly ferocious, rare monster. It growls at Ivy, giving her a little fright, but drops its head down, worn out from all the injuries it has sustained. Ivy gets saddened knowing it's going to die soon. She pets the Adondala, consoling it, telling the monster she was also scared when she was on the precipice of death. She knows she can't do anything for the beast, but promises to stay by its side. However, watching the two's sad interaction, Sora jumps up and envelops the beast in his body. Then his healing properties begin to kick in, and suddenly, the Andondola is injury-free. Post-healing, Ivy remarks that Sora talks a little faster now, with his signature phrase. Then the beast stands before them, and even though Ivy is afraid, she has nothing to fear, as the Andondola is a giant floof that caresses her lovingly. Which is crazy because according to her book, it takes a team of at least 5 high ranked adventurers to defeat this ferocious monster. But the big beast smiles warmly as Ivy pets it. As the three begin their stroll together, Ivy wonders if this means she has one more friend now. She pets the beast, saying it's time to name him. She stares at the sunlit sky, and she's got it. Your name is Ciel. It means sky in a different language, but she doesn't quite know how she knew that. She then makes her joyous introductions for her and Sora to Ciel, and the three continue their trek until Ivy senses some people. She decides to hide Sora in her magic bag, but there's no way Ciel is going to fit in there, and it wouldn't be good for people to see him. Ciel displays his intelligence, however, and dashes away to hide in the bushes. She arrives at the gate of the next town and sees the tall guard who seems a little scary. Even the passing traveler seemed to be scary to Ivy as well, with Sora also freaking out for some reason. The traveler tries to enter the town, but the guard stops him, asking what business he has with Latone Village. The traveler tells him he's visiting a friend. However, when the guard asks what the friend's name is, the man nervously responds, Z Z Zoliet. But the guard says, there's no one in the village by that name. The traveler begins to sweat with even more nervousness, saying, uh, actually, um, it's Lizola. With the guard clearly not accepting it, the traveler then says, no, it might have been, uh, Maklua, but the guard isn't buying his BS. He throws the traveler against the wall and raises his sword, slashing the traveler's bag to see a magic bag fall out. And in the magic bag, the guard finds illicitly brewed alcohol and grabs the traveler by the neck and has his fellow guard, Velavera escort the Traveler to jail. Ivy, now realizing the Traveler was a bad man, wondered if Sora somehow knew that already, and he answers with his poo 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 as if to confirm. Ivy is still scared of the red-haired guard, wondering if she should just give up on passing through Latome Village. But she knows with the guard staring at her, running away would only be suspicious. She tries to walk through, but freaks out when she gets stopped. The guard, of course, has never seen her before and wants to know who her parents are. She begins to answer, only to see the guard's fearsome glare meeting her, making her face grow pale. Ivy notices a mantis land on his shoulder. However, the glare was all in her head, as we see he has a more relaxed look. She mentions the bug, causing the man to freak out a little and scurry it away, and thanks her once it's off his shoulder. She tries to walk away, but gets stopped again, because the guard isn't done inquiring about her. She tells him she's from Latomi Village, and the guard is shocked to hear she came from so far away, but apparently he heard things are quite tough in Latomi right now. Ivy has no idea what he means by that, but the guard kneels towards her, reassuring Ivy that now that she's in Latome, she'll be safe, and as long as she becomes an adventurer, she can earn enough to eat. But the only thing she thinks of when walking away is what happened to her home village. She stares in awe at how active this big village is. She heads to the butcher, offering to make a deal for selling field mice and other wild game. The butcher is fine with it, but warns Ivy that if she hunts alone, she might be attacked 
attacked by Nanoshi monsters. And as she leaves the butcher, Ivy wonders if Nanoshi had actually broken her field mouse traps. She heads to the adventurer's clearing so she can set up a resting space, but gets scared again seeing the big supervisor guard. The guard tells Ivy she'll be safe in this direction, but she needs this permit otherwise she won't be permitted to come here. Ivy then sets up a resting tarp and crashes on the pleasant feeling ground. Looking in front of her are bigger tents, implying there are mid-level adventurers there, while in her area, the smaller tents imply novice adventure. Seeing the tents made her wish she had one, since she'd have to worry less about the weather, and of course, she'd be able to let Sora out of the bag. But come to think of it, she still has the tip reward, doesn't she? Ivy heads back in the town to do some tent shopping and finds a second-hand tent shop. She turns from reading the shop sign and is frightened to see the town guard asking if she's looking for a tent. But he also gets a little startled, and the other guard, Villavera, scolds him, saying not to scare the children. With Ivy telling them she has no tent, the guards wonder if she had gotten driven out of her village with nothing. Then Villavera remarks the difficulties in Latomi must be real. The red-haired guard finally introduces himself as Ogto and tells her he's going to take take Ivy to a different shop and begins to drag her there. However, after Villavera scolds Ogto for being too rough since he's a much bigger guy, he begins to apologize and Villavera confirms his friend to be dense, but truly a kind-hearted man. So they head to another tent shop. And when the shop owner hears Ivy is from Lotomi Village, he feels sorry for her. She then asks for the price for a tent and wonders if five Gidal would be enough, which if y'all remember, it's the equivalent of selling 50 field mice. She tells them she has two ladle, which is equivalent to 200 field mice. And everyone is shocked to hear this little boy has so much money. So Ivy explains in the last village, she gave them a monster tip and received this monetary reward as a tip. And everyone commends her on her lucky find. The shop owner then offers this light, sturdy, new model of tent. Afterwards, Ivy marks her tent with a kanji for Sora. But huh? How did she know that? Perhaps it's a memory from her past life. The shop owner then hands Ivy a new model of magic bag. It's special in that whenever Ivy takes something out of it, no one can see what's inside, giving her stuff an extra layer of security. She then says her farewells to the guards and begins the setup of her wonderful new tent. It seems quite spacious for little Ivy. She pulls out her sleeping little slime and wakes him to see their new tent, causing him to jump around in joy over their new resting conditions. She reflects over the many people that have been so nice to her during her travels and is happy she was finally able to get something she feels is akin to a house again. She wonders if she's truly deserving of all the good fortune she's come upon but lets the painful words and treatment from her village go to tell Sora they should celebrate their new tent. So how does Ivy like to celebrate? Well, by going to a trash dump, of course. She heads outside her tent, and a rough-looking guy from a group of adventurers sees Ivy and shows a malicious smile. The group walks over to her, and the big guy accuses Ivy of being a thief, with his buddy saying, yeah, it's actually his tent. He then accuses her out loud for stealing his tent and tells her to give it back. I get what these guys are doing, and I hate them. Ivy affirms she didn't steal it. She bought it herself, of course. But the big guy calls Ivy a liar and tells her there's no way she could buy this, grabbing a hold of her outfit trying to bully her. And the women shame her for having a terrible upbringing being such a liar. Ivy tries to run away and the man grabs her and shouts at Ivy saying he'll kill her, which brings her to tears. However, the clearing guard comes over to ask what's wrong, telling them that anyone who causes trouble will be charged a fine and thrown out. The rough guy tells the guard that Ivy stole his tent and that they're the victims. But of course, the guard asks where their evidence is. The smug adventurer then says, look at the kid. There's no way this little boy could buy a tent like this. It's just common sense. But the guard comes over and seizes the man's hand, freeing Ivy. The guard tells him the tent belongs to the little boy. And even with the adventurer still trying to accuse Ivy, the guard confirms this is an item bought from Old Man Lag's shop and that Captain Ogto and Vice Captain Velavera of the Latome Village Watch were the ones that brought Ivy there, making the adventurers shrink back in astonishment as they'd been caught. Yeah, you losers are about to get it now. The guy with the bandana gets nervous and says, whoops, I must have been mistaken, it's not actually my tent. Then the guard tells the adventurers he'd like to hear their story in more detail and tells them they're going to be detained. But the leader tries to reassure them they just had the wrong idea. However, with the guard cracking his knuckles, it's definitely over for these guys, telling them if they try to run, he'll show no mercy. The adventurers try to split, so the guard whistles, summoning the rest of his team, and now the adventurers are surrounded. 
with the main guard pinning the bandana adventurer down. The adventurer group leader and one of the girls makes a run for it, with the guards chasing after them. Afterwards, the clearing guard leader checks on Ivy's condition, asking if she's hurt, and Ivy thanks him for saving her. He then hands Ivy a potion as consolation for having to deal with such a scary incident, and she's excited because it's sparkling brand new. So new, the refraction from the sunlight makes the blue shine on her face. The guard then leaves to go interrogate the criminals, and Ivy is happy happy for how things turned out. Later that night, Ivy celebrates, surrounding Sora and tons of potions. As she's about to eat, she wonders what's wrong as Sora isn't devouring the potions like usual. But when she realizes he has his sights set on the new potion, she tells him no because she needs to keep it for herself. He just looks up at her, acting all cute then begins whining because he really wants it, ending their night peacefully as they argue back and forth about who gets the potion. Another beautiful day comes and Ivy stretches excited for the day, then looks at little Sora who is excited for more hunting. She says goodbye to the clearing guard on the way out and as she exits the city, it seems one guard after another greets Ivy by name and she seems concerned with each one since she'd never spoken to any of these guys before. Everyone seems to know who she is. Outside the town, it seems a monster had destroyed Ivy's hunting trap again. Oh man, they'll never catch anything at this rate. She then senses an unusual presence. Oh, it's Ciel with several bunnies in his mouth. He sets them down on the ground making Ivy ask if they're for her and Ciel growls in an affirming tone. So she thanks him and the two embrace in loving care. Looks like it's nine rabbits. Ivy is pumped to start dressing them to sell. Over by a creek, Ivy begins to work while Ciel and Sora play. She broke a sweat preparing the little meat pouches. It took long enough for Sora and Ciel to fall asleep. She wakes him up because she still has to sell the meat. Staring at Ciel, Ivy is surprised he's so docile and kind, considering he's supposed to be a rare, dangerous, Adondala monster. He goes in for more pats, and after they say goodbyes for now, Ciel growls like a regular cat. On their way back to town, Ivy tells Sora he looks much stronger now. Before, he used to look like he could disappear at any time, all while he jumps on a stick and tumbles over, getting dizzy, making Ivy remark that his clumsy side hasn't really changed. Ivy heads to the butcher to sell the rabbit meat, and the butcher is pleased since the meat is very fresh and without gamey scent. The butcher is happy because the rabbits must have been caught without taking any organ damage. Ivy replies nervously that she caught them in a trap, leaving the butcher a little curious because the rabbits tend to struggle in traps, which generally degrades the flavor. But of course, Ivy can't divulge into the fact that she tamed a super rare Adondala who caught them for her. The butcher hands over Ivy's payment and is happy for Ivy to bring over quality meats like this anytime. As Ivy walks, Relieved she was able to sell something because of Ciel's work. One of the guards brightly asks if she was able to make some good money today. Another one greets her, asking if she faced any danger against the Noshi monsters. And another asks if she caught a lot of good things to eat. Her voice gets a little worn out, having to deepen it to sound like a boy, so she hides in an alley to avoid any more idle chatter with the guards. Until she gets caught by Villavera, who asks her why she's hiding in a place like this. While they walk together, he's realized all the trouble Captain Ogto has caused her. He made the nice gesture of telling the other watchmen that if an adventurer named Ivy is in trouble, be sure to help him out, making sure everyone knew that Ivy was young and hardworking, so fellow guards should look out for him whenever they can. Octo is a little blockheaded, because when he gets an idea in his head, no one can stop him, but he really means well. Villavera sees Ivy off, as he has other things to do. Ivy continues her walk, sighing as she appreciates the thought of Octo's gesture, but she doesn't like to stand out. However, with the guards waving at her, she's cheery, thinking this town might be a good place. Something then catches Ivy's attention. It's Zaro fruit, a specialty from her hometown of Latomi. But they're super expensive here. The fruit seller tells her it's taken him a long time to procure these, as Latomi is the only place that can grow these fruits. But with a super bad crop this year, it's been particularly hard to buy them. The man learns Ivy is from Latomi Village and asks where her parents are. But when Ivy explains she's traveling alone, the man remarks it must be that idiot village head's fault. However, Ivy wonders what he means. He explains that fortune teller Luba has always protected the Zaro crops of Latomi Village, as the time of harvesting the fruit was always tricky. Because if the timing was missed even by a little, the Zaro fruit wouldn't be good for selling. Zaro fruit is Latomi's main source of income. That's why the villagers loved and respected Mistress Luba. The man heard, however, that the village head couldn't stand that. So when Luba had fallen ill, he hadn't given her any medicine. That's what the people say, anyways. 
This makes Ivy shocked, thinking back to when she had snuck into the church to hear some women talking about how strange it was that Luba had died of a cold at this time of year. The man also explains there's a rumor the village head is trying to blame it all on a child making Ivy's face grow dark as she remembers the horrible words the village had proclaimed about her, the starless, cursed child. The man continues on about how, with the passing of Luba, Latomi Village's Zaro harvest fell, and they fell into a financial hardship. So the head has been trying to reduce the number of mouths to feed, and that some of the villagers rebelled, took their families, and left the village. Others who defied the head were thrown out. A complete disaster. He then asks why Ivy left, and she explains her parents sided with the head, and that caused problems, clutching her jacket tight at the thought of the horrific betrayal from her family. The man then feels bad for Ivy, so he hands her a Zaro fruit something that she's thankful for. She sits inside her tent with Sora, reflecting on the events that had happened in Latomi Village. Despite all the mistreatment, she's still worried about what's happened to her family. To which I say, forget him and I hate him. And I think the deflating Sora agrees with me too. Her family cast her aside, and now she's in an unfamiliar place with people she doesn't know. But now, she's finally having fun again. Especially now that she has both Sora and Ciel, Captain Ogto and Villavera. The whole town here in Latome has been so kind to her, and she also still has her past self who speaks to her. And now, even a small home too. She wonders if this is what people call happiness. So Sora bounces up in joy, and as per usual, Ivy has no idea what he's saying. She giggles because she doesn't understand, but in a way, she does understand. Because they're friends, after all. She takes a bite and enjoys the taste of the Zaro fruit. The same as she used to have when she was little. The same flavor that Luba protected. She then thinks of when Luba had told her to head to the town neighboring the royal capital, but if she found a place that she'd like to live in forever while on her journey, she could stay there as well. It's another wonderful day, and Ivy does her usual rounds of good mornings with all the town's watchmen. She heads outside for some good hunting, setting up several traps, being conscious of putting them in places Nano she won't step on. She then heads with Sora to a trash fill because he needs something to eat as well, but suddenly stops because she senses some people, so she has Sora jump in the bag. And oh my god, it's the two adventurers who bullied her earlier that escaped. The man blames her for getting his friends arrested the other day, even though they're the ones who bullied her and she didn't really do anything. As Ivy backs away from the approaching thug, he's got a vicious smile, recalling Ivy has a rare slime with her, and tells her if she wants to leave safely, to hand the slime over. Ivy refuses because Sora is her friend, and the girl adventurer tells Ivy that if she doesn't, she'll be going through something more painful. The man stands above Ivy, telling her she's going to be beaten to a pulp, and Ivy stares in fear with the big adults about to thrash her. She makes a run for it, and as the thugs chase after her, she makes a quick left and gets the man caught in one of her traps. The girl adventurer mocks him, and he angrily cuts the rope off himself, exclaiming the boy will not get away alive. The girl then appears in front of Ivy, and the man picks Ivy up, with the mugging about to commence. When Ivy struggles, the girl grabs a hold of her as well, telling her to stop moving, but then the thug girl becomes nervous as they see that Ciel has appeared before them. They put Ivy down and back away at the sight of the majestic Adondola, who's ready to maul their disgusting, disgraceful faces alive. And when Ciel roars, the girl faints, and the man quickly dashes away while Ciel chases after him. Ciel is so fast, however, catching up to the man was inevitable, and Ciel brings the man back like he's the rabbit prey he had caught earlier. Yeah, that's what you get, you pathetic, worthless, trash human beings. Ciel comes in towards Ivy for head pats, another day with a job well done, and Ivy stares at the thugs, wondering if Ciel had done this to the rabbits the other day. Ivy senses more people and has Ciel hide. She hears a familiar voice call out, so she calls the voice over to her. It's Captain Ogto and Villavera, who check on Ivy to make sure she isn't hurt. While patrolling, they heard a monster's roar and human screams, so they hurried over. Ivy gestures to the two wanted criminals from the other day leaving Ogto and Velavera flabbergasted. At Ogto's place, he goes over a report with her about those two adventurers, and apparently they've all been under investigation for other potential crimes they'd committed. They've been stealing money and goods from young adventurers and using false accusations. Several times their crimes had been reported to the Adventurers Guild, but it had been difficult to put together evidence against them. Also, the two they had caught today were specifically wanted for murder, and their punishment will be to now become slaves with no chance of emancipation. I'ma say, serves them right. The other two caught also got sentenced to slavery, but for a shorter term, and Ivy is relieved to finally be able to rest easy. Ogto brought her here for a particular reason, 
Since she helped with their capture, she'll be receiving monetary rewards, which shocks Ivy because she's getting paid two Liddell and three Gadol, and loses her mind realizing she's being paid 2,300 field mice worth. And with all the money she has right now, she's got a net worth of 5,000 field mice. He hands Ivy the money and tells her if she hasn't already, she should go make a bank account. Carrying all this money can be a little dangerous. So they head to the trade guild. That way Ivy can make a deposit where the banker has her sign in a drop of blood. Ogto reads her contract and learns Ivy is 8 years and 11 months old and is shocked to learn she's turning 9 soon. He thought Ivy was 6 or 7, but she exclaims she's not that little. She then deposits her money and receives a plate. Outside, Ogdo explains with the plate, she can withdraw funds at any trade guild in any village or town. Ivy thanks Ogto for all the help, and as he laughs, enjoying himself, Villavera appears angrily as he's been looking for his captain because Ogdo never said where he was going. Ogdo looks at him nervously saying, Oh, didn't I tell you? But of course he didn't. The three of them walk into the town, and Ogdo asks if Ivy has ever eaten the town's signature dish yet. It's Nanoshi skewers, something that Ogdo will treat Ivy to anytime she wants. And she smiles, looking forward to the delicious meal. She gets a head pat from Ogdo and wonders how long it's been since she was patted on the head. They then head to an eating spot, and when the chef sees Ivy, she jokes, asking if that's Ogdo's secret child, making him laugh and remark, adorable, isn't he? As they sit down at their table, Ivy stares in awe seeing how big the Nanoshi skewers are. She gets a little nervous hearing Ogto order 10 skewers for each of them, but he claims they're so good it'll be easy to eat this much. However, Villavera knows his captain is going overboard, not considering Ivy's current child build. The food arrives and Ivy has a bite of the delicious skewer. Villa Vera remarks the chef here is so skilled, anyone at the royal capital would love to eat it as well. And the chef explains she has a 4 star cooking skill, only 1 star under the highest at 5. Ivy grows a little sad remembering her own current star ranking. Ogdo then says the two criminals they caught today both had 3 star sprinting skills. Definitely why it was so hard to catch them before. He then asks what Ivy's current skill is. And Villavera remarks if her skill is a good fit, she could join the Watchmen here in the future. She sadly explains she's a tamer, and Nocto thinks it's a wonderful skill. He then asks how many stars, and she gets nervous, shaking at the feeling of having to mention it. Ogdo and Villavera might have caught on to who she is, having fled from Latomi Village. So Ogdo pats her and says, Sometimes, people with a lot of stars are totally useless too. Those thugs from today are a fine example of detriments to society. Villavera agrees, as many people with stars still fail to make use of their skill and end up taking the wrong path in life. It's the job of the Watchmen to keep such people under control. Ivy stares surprised, as Ogdo remarks, There are lots of one stars who are praiseworthy people, and that Ivy should be proud of all that she's done. By the end of the night, they wave their goodbyes, with her thinking about how she doesn't even have one star. And the next day, she says her goodbyes to the two as she plans to continue fulfilling her promise to Luba to head to the town next to the royal capital. Ogdo says anywhere she goes to mention his name. That way, she can get by easier. They tell her to come back anytime. Villavera then tells Ogdo the report he got from Latomi Village about all the one-star children, with Ivy being not on the list at all, and the only kid who had fled of being a starless eight-year-old girl. And Ogdo scratches his head, knowing that he couldn't unfortunately earn Ivy's trust enough for her to tell him the truth. They both understand how the events in Latomi must have deeply wounded her heart, and hope one day Ivy will be willing to open up to the both of them. It's another wonderful day, with Sora happily bouncing as Ivy chases after him. But he seems somehow faster than he's ever been. After finding a place to rest, Ivy finally sits down for a drink, and Sora comes bouncing with joy. So full of energy. Whatever will she do with him? Ivy's past life reveals Sora must have evolved further after healing CL's wounds. But she doesn't know what that really means. Sora spots something and Ivy has to chase after him again. And they find Yamamo plants that have been all dug up. And Ivy gets a little nervous wondering how big the Nanoshi monsters are. Falling to the ground at the thought of running from the dangerous boars. The bushes rustle behind her, increasing the fright. But oh! It's Ciel, the mighty Adondala beast, that now seems just like a giant floof when Ivy plays with her. Ivy just can't get enough of her beloved monsters. The night comes and Ivy enjoys some delicious rabbit skewers at the campfire. She thanks Ciel because she had caught so many for her. 
and giggles at the sight of Sora enjoying his dinner as well. She thinks about waking up early tomorrow so she can check on the field mice traps. But all is not at peace with the mysterious being watching her from the shadows. She checks her traps, but one after one, there doesn't seem to be a single mouse caught. But there's still meat left over from last night they can enjoy. Ivy then suddenly shivers at a chilling presence, and a black fog appears. Ivy makes a run for it, noting the black fog coming after her makes her feel sick. She eventually makes it to the ledge of a cliff, with nowhere else to run. And when she turns around to see it, she's astonished to find out it's not a monster, but what looks like to be a human causing this. Ciel comes in to give a mighty roar, making the human causing the fog to disappear, but only leaving Ivy with more questions about its origins. Ivy and Sora ride comfortably atop Ciel during their travels, but suddenly Ciel begins to get aggressive. There's an ogre scaling the cliff they're on, and one in front of them as well. Ivy puts Sora in the bag, and then Ciel engages one of the ogres in combat, biting its arm and taking the ogre off the cliff into the water. Rocks start to fall above Ivy, and four other ogres come crashing down towards her, so she makes a run for it. She makes it into a barren forest, staring in horror wondering why there are so many straw dolls being hung amongst the trees. But she can't stand for too long, as the ogres are catching up. She runs in further, but trips a trap, giving the ogres a chance to surround her. One of the ogres jumps up to attack, but suddenly, fire blasts him away. A man comes in shouting, Flame? Attack! And creates a burning tornado, with the fire spreading and cooking the ogres alive. The man then proudly says, Did you see that? That firestorm assault belongs to me, Latra. Although now staring nervously seeing Ivy burning up in a trap, he's surprised to see a child trapped up there. Then, an archer scolds Latra, saying he needs to learn to hold back, as he shoots Ivy down with her screaming before Latra catches her. He asks her why she's here, but she doesn't get a chance to answer with an ogre swinging its club above them. They get away, landing on some big bouncy slimes. Summoned by Latra's friend, Mila, as she takes her slimes back, she says she'd expect no less of the blazing sword of the suppression squads, referring to Latra, and their two friends cut down the ogres behind them. Latra was just a little surprised by Ivy is all. Another ogre then goes to strike, getting taken down by the arrows of who we now know as Shefal. Shefal scolds Latra for making the traps, since they didn't even catch the ogres. But Latra deflects saying, well, we got rid of them safely anyways. Afterwards, Ivy talks to the suppression squad. They're here because a lot of monsters have settled in this area, and they've been sent here to hunt them. The traps were meant to hunt ogres, but Latra sent the entire area ablaze, so there was little point in using them. They worry if Ivy is hurt at all, so giving her best boy voice impression, she replies, uh, No sir, I'm alright. Thank you so much for saving me. Um... She doesn't know how to refer to the group, so Latra tells her they are a group of adventurers known as the Blazing Sword. The man with white hair and the big sword is their leader, Sezelk. The man with the red hair and axe is Noga. There's Shefal, the archer of course, Latra, and Mila, known as the Green Gale. Ivy thanks them formally with her hood falling over her, giving everyone a good laugh. As they walk downhill towards their campsite, Shefal asks what she was doing here in the mountains. She tells them she was on her way to Atolwa, from where she had just left Latome Village. They're surprised to hear she came all the way from Latome here by herself, and we learn from Latra that they're all actually from Atolwa. With monsters still being around the area, Sezelk tells Ivy to keep traveling with them because they're heading back to their town anyways. They find their campsite and start heading towards it. However, Ivy finds Ciel who comes out of the bushes and cleanses herself like a proper cat. Ivy is happy to see Ciel at first but is concerned that if anyone finds Ciel now, she'll probably be hunted. Ivy warns her cat to go hide, but it looks more like she's playing charades. Ciel just stares, as I'm pretty sure she doesn't understand at all. She eventually walks away, and Ivy takes off with the Blazing Sword group. Back at their campsite, many other adventurers are taking respite here as well, so the campsite has gotten a lot bigger. They've put monster repellent around the perimeter, so there's no fear of being attacked. At the Blazing Sword group's tent, Sezelk tells Ivy she can put her tent next to theirs. The group then heads out for their meeting, leaving Latra behind who seems pretty nervous. He's nervous because he's on cooking duty tonight, but he's bad at cooking apparently. No matter how hard he tries, people always say that his food tastes strange or it's too gamey, and now he's too scared to cook. Ivy asks what kind of dishes he usually prepares, 
Despite how he looks, Latra has three-star flame attack skills. So he grills, he roasts, torching everything in sight, and he seasons with salt and pepper. This somehow only leaves Ivy nervous about his cooking, but she's happy to help him. She sprinkles the wild rabbit meat with herbs to remove the gaminess and rubs in some salt for seasoning, then cuts the meat into bite-sized pieces to saute them evenly and adds chopped vegetables to stew them in a pot with meat, adding more herbs here for aroma and flavor. Then with this mo meat, she adds mildly spicy herbs and fries it in a nice brown color, leaving Latra in awe at the skill of Ivy's cooking. With dinner set, the guys from Blazing Sword awe at the food and sit to enjoy. With just a tiny bite, they begin to tear up, making Ivy nervous that the food isn't to their liking. But no, they were crying in joy over how great it is. Even with the wild rabbit, there isn't a hint of gaminess and an aroma that is beautiful. Ivy knows that food cooked together with nice smelling leaves at high heat helps remove gaminess from the meat and wonders if people around here don't know about that. Mila arrives back ready to enjoy the meal that Ivy made and blushes at the delicious taste. Nuga almost chokes from eating too quickly. Shafal was worried about leaving Latra in charge of dinner tonight. But wait, did Ivy do all the cooking? Latra nervously tries to defend himself but Ivy covers him saying, they made it together. With his skill adjusting the heat, Ivy was able to cook very well, and to deflect their attention further, he shows off his skillful display of fire magic, and everyone enjoys the fireworks. She notes that if they had some variety of metals, the flames could even be more beautiful, so Mila pulls out pieces of broken equipment, and Ivy ties them into a firecracker for Latra to fire, and when he lights it, an array of colors blows above the campsite a beautiful marvel unseen before in this world. Later that night, as Ivy cleans the dishes, Seizel comes over to tell her to take a break, since Ivy cooked for all of them. However, she begs them to let her clean, as a thank you for saving her and escorting her to their camp. Seizel says fine, but he wants to clean up with her, and Latra falls because Ivy is so adorable and earnest. She really is a sweetheart. Latra coddles Ivy because he's always wanted a little brother like him and the rest of the gang comes over to beat him up. Ivy makes it inside her tent, offering the sleeping Sora some blue potions to eat. He's cheery, but she shushes him to quiet down because people are sleeping. After she falls asleep, we see Ivy combing her hair, and she reflects on the day. She's glad the group of adventurers she's met are good people. With lights out, we see Shafal saddened that little Ivy traveled all the way here by himself. Nuga thinks Ivy is too thin and must not have been eating well. Seizelk thinks Ivy is too conscious of others because Ivy gave an anxious look when being told to rest. And with the happiness Ivy expressed when being allowed to clean, it's as if Ivy has had it in his head that if he isn't useful, he'll be cast aside. All while Latra lies in his bed hearing them all, he chews on these ideas. But still, the night ends with Ivy and Sora resting peacefully. It's another great morning, Ivy having rested peacefully at the Blazing Sword camp goes for her usual trash dump run, discovering some potential breakfast portions for Sora. Some slimes walk by to dissolve some of the trash, meaning there's another monster tamer here. It's Mila who commands her slimes Lasto and Lidl to continue disposing of the trash. Apparently they're rare slimes that have the ability to consume swords and those who control rare slimes are afforded high social standing, meaning Mila has tons of connections. Ivy asks Mila if she's ever seen a disintegrating slime before, but she hasn't. Because it's super rare, if managed to be caught, it could be easily sold for a large sum. Ivy then all of a sudden feels a presence that makes her sick, the same presence she felt when she was being chased by the dark wind. Mila tries to ask her what's wrong, but before Ivy can explain, Latra comes along with other adventurers to dump their trash. Turns out, those ogres were tough to deal with, so they have tons of weapons that are worn out and they need Mila to dispose of them. Also, with the ogres being completely extinguished, the group is now returning to Otolwa. They celebrate at night with drinks and Ivy serving them skewers. And delicious cocoa meat soup as well. The whole gang is impressed by the various cooking techniques Ivy has accumulated. As they enjoy themselves, Ivy worries about Ciel, since the group said they had eliminated all the monsters. But Ivy's past self reassures her that if they were fighting her Adondala, there'd be a huge fuss and everyone would know about it immediately. And she's right, Ciel is yawning away from the camp. The entire group gathers around Ivy and Mila introduces her older twin brothers, Tolto and Malma. 
The three make up the Green Gale group. The twins come by and praise Ivy as their sister had mentioned how intelligent she was and wanted Ivy to join their group when she grows up. However, Latra butts in saying, no way since Ivy is going to be his little brother. But Sazel gives him a good smack telling Latra to stop messing around. At the sight of the adventurer group Lightning King approaching, Mila and her siblings decide to leave the scene. Apparently the twins Toto and Malma aren't comfortable around Lightning King's captain, Barolda. However, she's happy with the captain affirming Ivy should be traveling with Sezelk back to town. Back in her tent, Ivy releases Sora so he can have his meal, bringing out tons of portions she was able to procure from the trash piles, making Sora cheer so loud she needs him to quiet down. While the two relax, Ivy feels the same sickening presence from earlier. She decides to hide Sora away as the presence draws closer, but it just suddenly disappears. Outside her tent, Latra calls out to her. Turns out, he was hoping Ivy would help him cook tomorrow's breakfast in the morning. However, with him leaving, she's still wary of that strange presence she felt. She goes back inside and wonders if Latra could potentially be the source of the presence. Sora tries to explain, however, it's meaningless because Ivy doesn't get it. She wonders if tamers with stars like Mila would be able to understand what he's saying. He begins a staticky vibration, reminding Ivy of how he was shaking those times when they passed by the guy with the illegal alcohol and the gang of murderers. She decides to ask Sora about Latra, Sezelk, Noga, and Shifal, and Sora responds cheerfully. However, when hearing Mila of the Green Gale, he begins his fearful shakes, indicating she must be the source of the sickening aura. At the Altoa village gate, the gate guard tries to check Ivy with name and originating village. However, when proving Captain Ogto from Latome is her guarantor using her bank tablet, she is granted permission with a simple name signing. Entering in, she stares in awe at the big bustling town of Atolwa. They decide to set a place to rest at the Adventurer's Clearing, where Sezelk explains even though they had just finished clearing the monsters surrounding the area, they all can't go home yet as there are dangerous people also causing a problem. Barolda adds that people are being abducted and sold into slavery by a criminal organization. The Town Watch located their hideout and raided it earlier, but it seems the information was leaked and the hideout completely deserted. It deeply angers Sezelk to know people are being abducted, but there have been no reports of any suspicious character sightings. Ivy's particularly worried after learning she's a prime target. This organization primarily targets children. The entire group wishes they had some sort of lead or clue, so Ivy decides to share her experience of almost getting attacked, making everyone gasp in astonishment. A man from Barolda's group then releases a barrier so they can discuss without any outside ears listening. Ivy then recounts her story of being chased in the forest by a sickening presence before she met Blazing Sword. But when a monster, aka CL, appeared, the presence ran away. The group praises Ivy on her particular talent of sensing things, which she had acquired living in forests alone for the last few years. She then talks about the dark presence she felt back at camp that had disappeared when Latra came by, making Sezelk suspect the star of Blazing Sword. However, Latra clears himself with his alibi being he had just come by to ask Ivy to help him make breakfast and Nuga suspects the appearance of Latra made the one with the dark presence flee. She begins to explain the real culprit as Mila, but when asked for evidence, she recalls Mila saying such a rare slime could be sold at a high price, and the adventurer group who had tried to steal Sora from her. She couldn't stand the thought of more people coming after Sora, so instead of elaborating further, Ivy tells them to forget what she said. Night comes, and in her tent, Ivy has no idea what to do, given she can't just tell people about him. Sora just lightly affirms with his constant poo 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 phrasing, making Ivy wonder if he's trying to say it's alright if she tells them about him. Ivy then remembers when Luba had told her all secrets will eventually come to light, and that one day, Ivy would need people who will fight beside her. In the morning, she sees her allies in the clearing. She's about to make breakfast, but Sezelk stops her for the secluding barrier to cast around them. Bad news, they did in fact find out about a darker side to Mila of the Green Gale, and her older brothers as well. After hearing Ivy's tip yesterday, they decided to track Mila's every movement, and they spotted Green Gale doing some clandestine business with a traveling merchant. One of the men from Barolda's group tried even testing them as the merchant was leaving, and everyone from Green Gale only claimed they were giving direction to a lost man. But 
They're especially suspicious, also using a sound barrier like this one to prevent their conversation from leaking. They'd never use it to simply give directions. Shifa also looked into the merchant at the trading guild, but learned the merchant wasn't conducting any business in this town. Putting it all together, a merchant from another town using a costly magic item that prevents sound from leaking, yet not conducting any business? The team is upset, as many of them are good friends with Mila and her brothers. However, Seizelk is glad they finally have a lead to the abductions. Ivy is surprised they believed her so easily without too much evidence. So Latra asks her why she makes food for them. She replies, it's because she wants everyone to enjoy the things they eat. That statement alone and the way Ivy behaves is all reason enough for them to know she's not a person who would lie to them. Hearing this makes her smile. Her eyes gleam. She thinks she's nothing to anyone and yet they still trusted her. She then reveals to them she is in fact a tamer and the slime she tamed was the one who told her about Mila. She brings them back to her tent and introduces Sora and everyone stares in awe as they've never seen a rare transparent slime before. She's not sure why but Sora somehow has the ability to see through bad people and immediately Barolda and Seizelk understood why Ivy had to keep Sora a secret since the rarity of the slime could have brought pursuers after them. So. Everyone in the group promises to keep him a secret. One of the men named Rickvelt begins to pet the cute slime, and Latra brags about Ivy, singing Ivy's praises because he found him first. Apparently, transparent slimes are only ever heard of in legends and stories, all while Rickvelt continues to pet Sora with his head, only for him to get pulled away by Shifal and beaten up. After recovering from his pounding, Rickvelt decides to test Sora's ability to see through evil. He claims himself to be Latra of the Blazing Sword, which makes Sora spaz out like all the other times he'd come across wrongdoers. But they already mentioned his name, so Sora might just not like Rickvelt from the excessive petting. The man with the blonde hair then tries next, claiming his name to be Maurik, which of course causes Sora to spaz when we learn his name is actually Lokrik. <laughs> man. I don't know if I can keep going on with all these weird names. But anyways, Maurik is actually the bald guy above him who secretly drank all of Shifal's alcohol last night. Something Sora confirms is true. However, Shifal isn't happy about his missing alcohol, giving Maurik a nasty look, chasing after him and beating him up. As the group eats their meals under a barrier, Seizelk remarks on how he never expected the traders to be from the Green Gale group. Baralda then adds that it makes sense since they've never been able to find any clues on the kidnapping organization. The enemies had been hiding in plain sight all along, but now, knowing Mila, Tolto, and Malma are the traders, it'll make it easier to snuff out the rest of the villains. Ivy agrees with a saddened tone, prompting Latra to ask if it's hard for Ivy to think of Mila as a bad person. And he's right on the money. He's apparently known Mila ever since they were kids. For Rickvelt, Malma is a good friend of his as well, which is why he wants to stop him with his own hands. No one is happy to have to detain their friends. Baralda then explains the kidnapping incident started around 10 years ago. People thought that kids were going missing because they'd fallen victim to monsters. But seven years ago, Baralda and Seizelk's group discovered the existence of the clandestine organization when they had taken some of the victims who had escaped under their protection. Ivy then concludes there must be other traitors in the organization, causing everyone to audibly gasp. If the organization has been around that long, there has to be more than just one team of traitors. Seizelk agrees, bringing up that time again when they had raided the criminal's hideout to find nobody, knowing there were only a handful of people other than the Green Gale that could have exposed their plans. A bigger problem is that the Green Gale's promotion was endorsed by a member of the nobility, which is why Barolda's group trusted them. This isn't usual, as most nobles actually look down on adventurers. So why would they promote the Green Gale to other high-ranking adventurer groups? The gang then gets annoyed as they couldn't figure out how obvious it was that this particular noble is involved, something even a seven-year-old could figure out. But Ivy starts to whine hearing that. Even though she doesn't look like it, she's a nine-year-old. Her birthday is at the end of the eighth month, and she just happened to turn nine today. Upon hearing this, everyone begins wishing Ivy a happy birthday and clap for her, causing her to blush and thank them. The current situation is more dire, so Latro proposes a proper birthday celebration later, instead of just these well wishes. However, Ivy assures him these are more than enough. She smiles warmly, wondering how many years it's been since someone had told her, happy birthday. Latra then questions if she's really nine though, because at times she says things and cooks so well 
She seems much older, probably because of the insight from her past self. Getting back to the task at hand, they decide to figure out who else they can trust in this town. They head to the Adventurer's Guild to test the Guildmaster, Rogleaf or Mr. GM. Sora seems to react positively to him. Then, the Captain of the Watch, Berksby, introduces himself. Sora is still positive. And finally, Captain Agra, and Sora is still fine. Barolda pulls out a little crystal and observes the three, saying it's a magic item that can tell if someone who has spoken is good or bad. This is of course to prevent the exposure of Ivy's rare slime. Ivy makes the excuse that the item only lasts for a week before it becomes a useless stone, so Rogleaf tells them he'd like the gang to use it to uncover members of the criminal organization. That way, they can find the traitor who passed on the information about their investigations. He then orders all adventurers to be summoned here. The gang then heads to the merchant's house that the criminal organization had used as their base. To preserve as much evidence as possible, watchmen stand guard while they continue to investigate. Captain Berksby introduces the two guards to Ivy. However, Sora reacts to the second guard with green hair, Malgaljala. Ivy signals Barolda and Latra walks up to build simple rapport, and it's clear Berksby is pissed at his subordinate. They walk inside and Vice Captain Agrop isn't happy because he really trusted that guy. However, all the Watchmen were summoned here too, so they intend to dig up every single criminal that's a part of the kidnappings. Day turns to evening, and everyone is exhausted. No one is happy to find out that out of 150 Watchmen, 38 of them are traitors, meaning all their previous moves were for sure leaked. Then appears Count Faltoria and Lord Faranda to congratulate them on their work in investigating the crime scene, but we know they were really here to discover all the traitors. When the two introduce themselves to Ivy, Valtoria triggers Sora, making it clear he's a noble that's a part of the big crimes. However, Veranda checks out as a good guy. When they leave, everyone is disappointed because Valtoria is a hero to this town. But everything makes sense now, as there had to be someone powerful in control. Captain Berksby's emotions spiral, remembering all the failed raids and the allies that were killed in combat. He punches the wall in frustration, knowing he's the one who informed the Count of their movements previously, blaming himself for the death of his men. They try to calm him down, after all, the evil organization are the ones to blame. Ivy then observed that the time between their arrival here and Count Valtoria's was a little short. It couldn't have been simply by chance. One of the traitors must be hiding near this base to keep an eye on it. They then begin to wonder how all the evidence here could have been displaced, knowing there were still guards on the good side watching this base. So Ivy quickly concludes the places where the bad guards were instructed to search must be areas that contained evidence. It's just the bad guards didn't report any. They head to the room the front bad guard Malgaljala was in charge of and send him away with another task. While searching inside, Ivy's past life tells her there must be a secret in the bookcase, like in the movies. Uh, but Ivy has no idea what a movie is. She spots the only book where the corner of the spine is scuffed and decides to climb and push it, unlocking the magic door containing tons of hidden records. Inside, the gang finds incredible sums of money beyond any imagination of wealth. Berksby then finds records of the organization's business dealings containing evidence of kidnappings. He then suggests that they put everything back till the organization believes they hadn't found the evidence yet. The next day, outside, everyone has been mulling over how big this whole operation really is. No one has been able to sleep, and with how dangerous everything is, they can't leave Ivy alone for any reason. So Latra follows Ivy while she does laundry. He then asks something he's been wondering for a while now. Is he really a boy? Upon hearing this, Ivy begins tearing up, but she's just sorry for deceiving all of them. However, Latra says it's fine, especially knowing it's more dangerous for girls to travel alone. He says it's better this way for now, and he'll pretend he doesn't know. But next to make her entrance is Mila of the Green Gale. She offers idle chit-chat and to bring Ivy along to explore the town with her to find delicious sweets shops. Latra then invites himself, something that Mila protests, saying she wasn't inviting him, even with her seeming reluctant at first. She then says, Fine, all five of us can go, with her older brothers Tolto and Malma deviously walking in. Latra, Ivy, and Green Gale have a stare off. Yo, why does Green Gale look so evil now? Latra and Mila walk up to each other even closer, but it's only to play rock, paper, scissors? Latra wins, so they're going to his spot of choice. Although, Ivy seems a little confused at the game between the two childhood friends. Inside the sweet shop, Tolto and Mama are munching on the desserts, finishing so quickly they need more. 
Latra then asks why Ivy was invited out, and Toto explains Mila likes Ivy because he's a really good kid, so they couldn't keep wondering and invited him out. Mila scolds the two brothers for scaring her, and when she turns to Ivy, she laughs very nervously. Looking at Sora, seeing his scared reactions, without a doubt, these three are dangerous. Latra gets up, ready to brandish, telling them if they pick on Ivy, he'll show no mercy. But the twins tell him to stop playing around. They don't want to fight Latra, given he has three-star flame attacks. However, knowing Latra has no defensive skills, Toto wouldn't mind sparring to see who is stronger between them. Mila tells them to stop, wondering why people with combat-type skills are always so uncivilized, causing Toto to respond that she wouldn't understand. She only has the tamer skill, and she can't even tame strong monsters. With her slimes, she can only take out the trash. Hearing that causes her to sadden a little. Ivy gets up to defend her, saying Mila's two-star skill is amazing, and Lasto and Lidl are rare slimes that can dispose of weapons. Ivy has traveled to many trash dumps, where she'd find something useful. That's why she knows, even when people think something has no value, there will always be someone who treasures it. Mila's heart warms a little from this, and Latra agrees that being a tamer is a splendid job that can help others. But Toto thinks it's better to have something strong and flashy, since those things bring a lot of money. Malma adds that because their skills aren't that interesting, they're better off as adventurers. Because if they had more money, then they wouldn't be in this position. And hearing that leaves Ivy a little curious. Afterwards, Latra asks Ivy how they were, and she responds that Sora freaked out at all of them. She misunderstood. He met the sweets at the restaurant. They're absolutely a favorite of his. He chose the restaurant Flow Flow for a reason. It's run by an adventurer he trusts, so they'd always be safe in that shop. With all of Green Gale now being confirmed traitors, they find it sad. Latro reminisces on his childhood. This town was a safe place for children then, a place where adults would praise you for doing good and smack you when you'd cause mischief. Making Ivy remember her own hometown, before she turned five at least. Now, wherever a child goes, an adult has to be there to watch over them. With the children being tied to the adults, the town is uncomfortable and restricted. Latra wants to restore the peace this town used to have. Later, in the adventurer's clearing under the barrier, the gang learns of Green Gale's attempt to invite Ivy to have snacks with them. But to do it in broad daylight? Why would they go such lengths to target Ivy? Because of her being protected by both the Blazing Sword and Lightning King, it'd be a great risk for Green Gale, as they'd probably be the first suspects if Ivy went missing. Ivy's past life mentions the idea of a decoy, elaborating further the true nefarious organization wouldn't have a problem with Green Gale getting caught, as long as they can still remain in the shadows. And in fact, to spread word of the existence of traitors, it actually makes a lot of sense to send a well-known group like Green Gale to be scapegoats, sacrificial pawns that are a big enough distraction for the real evildoers to retrieve all the money hidden in the merchant's house. Green Gale would probably be disposed of to keep information from leaking. Latra gets concerned because he doesn't want to lose his childhood friend. This is when Ivy suggests letting herself get captured by Green Gale. That way, they can have her relay that security at the merchant base will be relaxed. Fake information that'll cause the evil organization to think it's safe to retrieve the money and documents. Meaning Blazing Sword and Lightning King can lie in wait to catch them. It's such a well thought out plan, they really wonder if Ivy is 9. They find the plan compelling, but Sezelk and Barolda don't want to put her in danger. They know once the fight with the organization begins, it'll be an all out war. But both the Watch and the Adventurers have many traitors amongst them. However, Latra promises to keep Ivy safe, no matter the cost. And Ivy logically concludes whether or not she's a decoy, she's still in danger of being targeted. So better to narrow the timing of the attacks by acting as bait, and also catch the culprits. They want to get this plan started, however, they're still worried about getting ambushed by other traitors. Ivy's past self then suggests tear gas bombs, but... That doesn't exist in this world. So she asks if there's a magic item that could put enemies to sleep, and Sezel brings up a sleep sphere. However, it'd put both enemy and allies asleep within range. Ivy stands up, because with the organization still not knowing that this group knows about them, the time to strike is now. She rallies everyone, because they can't let this opportunity pass. At the Adventurers Guild, 
Master Rogleaf calls all adventurers, telling them that the guild has been charged with guarding Ivy's safety. This is to show everyone in Altoa and outside of it that this town is safe, and he wants everyone to come up one by one and introduce themselves. With the first act about to begin, Ivy and Sora brace themselves. The first man, Adarically, triggers Sora, and they continue their work. Over at the merchant base, Vice Captain Agrock can tell Captain Berksby is a little antsy, but he denies it, saying it's just in his imagination. Berksby then mentions he saw Barolda smile. For a long time, they'd been troubled by this criminal organization. They were starting to grow weary and hopeless. Over and over, the town watch would corner them, and they'd flee, with every interaction having casualties. Whenever speaking of the organization, a sense of grim resolve hung in the air. But when Ivy speaks, Barolda smiles. Thanks to Ivy, the winds have changed. Berksby feels relieved over this. Shifal and gang approach to tell Berksby to organize a special unit. A monster lair has been discovered in a cave in the forest. Berksby is confused because he thought the suppression squads took care of all of them. But Shifal interjects, saying one escaped and hid there. They want to take out the monster in one go and are requesting a large number of watchmen. They're up against a ferocious foe and will have to deal with other menaces along the way. So Shafal suggests Berksby choose members accordingly. Wink wink. Berksby catches on and leaves the personnel selection to Vice Captain Agrop. With introductions at the Guild Hall finished, Rogleaf tells everyone to wait as he'll have a special assignment for them. Ivy is exhausted after all the hard work, but Sora is very cheery. Mila comes by to congratulate Ivy on his work and thanks Ivy for telling Mila her work of disposing of trash to be very important. It made Mila happy. Malma and Tolto come by to tell her she'll surely be safe now that all the adventurers know her face. With Latra telling them for sure now no one will come after Ivy. With Mila answering somewhat nervously that he's right. Latra then suggests they get sweets again now, but at a different place. To which Toto and Malma respond positively. However, this is all a ruse for Ivy and Latra's plans. Elsewhere, Berksby wants Shafal to divulge more details of the plan, but Shafal refuses since they don't know who might be listening. And he can't use a sound barrier as he wants to avoid having the organization think they're sharing secrets, which would put them on guard. Gaboldula comes up, having learned from Berksby that Vice Captain Agrop is downstairs putting together a watchman force to eliminate the monster in the forest. Nuga then mentions Berksby should rethink sending all of his men, since this place is still important to the criminal organization, so they should leave some men here. Maurik suggests Berksby leave the selection of men to Gabuljala, since he knows the place so well. After Gabuljala leaves, Shafal shows Berksby the sleep sphere, because the plan is when the enemy comes to reclaim this place, they're gonna have a nice rest. That and their allies as well. And when Shafal takes off, Nuga presents Berksby an item usually used on powerful monsters. Downstairs, Agrop has the forest unit ready, and Berksby notes that most of the men Gabuljala picked for guard duty of this place are traitors. Elsewhere, Mila brings them to Mamaroko, a sweet shop she really likes, and with the next part of their plan in motion, Ivy and Latra are ready to enter the belly of the beast. In the confectionery shop, Mila recommends Donzu to Ivy. It's supposedly the sweetest confection the shop has to offer. Latra warns against it as one bite is so sweet, it'll make your eyes roll back and you'll faint. <laughs> what kind of sweet is this? Mr. Hag, the shop owner, takes their five Donzu order. However, when Ivy looks at Sora, he trembles, signifying the shop owner is definitely a bad guy. Ivy signals Latro because it's time for the operation to begin. As their sweets are readied, Latro tells Green Gale he has a confidential request for them coming straight from the guild master. And he's telling them this because he trusts them so much. A special unit of watchmen and adventurers is being put together right now, and they're about to set out for the forest. While they're gone, security in town will be short-handed, so he needs their help in policing. Tolto and Malma wonder what could be going on that's so big that the Watchmen and Guildmaster would decide to leave the town wide open. Well, Latra explains ogres and an ogre king have been spotted in a cave in the forest, all while Mr. Hag is lacing their sweets with drugs? With the food being presented, Latra gives Ivy a denying no, as in, they're not going to eat it. And then, while hearing from Latra that the merchant base isn't being guarded so heavily, 
Mr. Hag exits the shop at a quick pace. Now that he's gone, Latra gets to what he really wanted to ask. Why is Green Gale helping the organization? And the three gasp when being asked how much they'll get for abducting Ivy. Mila tries to deny this at first. However, when Latra pushes his and Ivy's dishes towards them to taste, all three of them refuse. Looks like they'll be enjoying sweets in jail. Mila gives in, telling her brothers they should just give up. Malma refuses, but Mila responds, We've done enough, haven't we? All these cruel things. Is money really that important? Total gives a scowling look, asking if she's going to betray them, with Latro reminding the brothers that they're the traitors since they betrayed the trust the town had given them. The brothers get up quickly, uncaring about the consequences. With Toto and Malma brandishing their weapons, Latra tells them to stop because he doesn't want to fight them. But Malma begins his attack anyway. Latra easily parries all of his strikes and knocks him back. Even not having a skill in defense, Latra trained himself in defensive techniques. He believes his defense might even be stronger than Toto's defensive skill. Hearing this angers Toto, so he goes to strike with Latra blocking easily. Toto is one star in long swords, however, Latra is two stars, easily sending him back. Malma then gets up to attack again, and with Latra dodging every strike, Ivy screams that Toltol is behind him, so Latra burns him, and the two siblings have to douse the fire. The brothers go for another attack, but Mila summons Last and Lidl to dissolve their blades, and Latra is able to knock both of them out. Latra looks at Mila, who is totally done. She doesn't want to live this life of crime anymore. She apologizes for deceiving Ivy this entire time, but both Ivy and Latra thank her for saving their lives. Then enters Flo Flo, the proprietor of the first sweets shop they went to, asking what's going on. So Ivy divulges a bit of their plan to strike against the organization. At the merchant base, masked adventurers come to attack, but we can see it is all a ruse, with both sides corrupted giving signals that now's the time to move the treasure hidden inside. The corrupted watchman points the adventurers to a hidden room in the library on the third floor, with two non-corrupted watchmen having secretly watched them, unsure of what to do, not knowing who's friend and who's foe. Count Faltoria then gets escorted to the library, and he commands his followers to remove all the records and money this room holds. However, he trips the sleep sphere that knocks everyone out in the entire building, friend and foe. Heading towards the forest, Captain Berksby and Agrop know the guys behind them are trying to take them by surprise. But unfortunately, their plans have been foiled by a nine-year-old monster team. Behind them, Sezelk and Barolda are ecstatic for their side to go wild, as Berksby tosses Agrop their ace of their plan, which was suggested by Shafal. The watchmen behind place their hands on their swords, with Agrop noticing the traders are perfectly placed at the front. Berksby can tell they plan to take care of Agrop first, than him. It makes sense because the two of them are the strongest, and the traitors would want to leave no witnesses. The corrupted watchmen strike, but Agrop parries the arrow so Berksby can trap them with a net gun. But that's not a regular net, it's an electric one. Agrop then hops atop Berksby to fire another net, giving the signal to Sezelk to slug the corrupted adventurers, with the blazing sword and lightning king beginning their brawl with the evil doers. After Barolda headbutts one of the guys, a good adventurer is flabbergasted as he has no idea what's going on. So Barolda debriefs him a little bit about the plan, and Sezelk gives the command to capture all traitors. After a successful fight, Berksby explains this net is usually meant for large monsters, as it's imbued with potent magic that suppresses physical strength. One of the watchmen tries to play dumb, asking what their captain is doing. So Berksby replies that he's investigated all of you traitors. With Agrop giving another shock to them, and that's what they get. They sold kids into slavery. Get them out of here. But unfortunately, some of the good ones are trapped in there too. Whoops. Well, they're still grateful for their assistance in capturing the bad ones. They were able to safely capture all the traitors within the watch, and all the traitors among the adventurers as well, all thanks to the plan Ivy came up with. She doesn't want to take all the credit, but they can't help but thank her for saving the town. As Count Faltoria gets ushered in, telling the man behind him to unhand him. However, Lord Feranda tells him he won't be getting freed. The Guildmaster had informed Feranda ahead of time, and after looking through all the documents hidden within the library, Faltoria's evil deeds have come to light. 
Veranda sent a messenger to the royal capital, meaning Valtoria's punishment is inevitable. And the villagers are just as unhappy, ready to drag out and kill all the traitors. I feel them, their kids taken and their town made unsafe by these villains. But Sezelk says it's bad because they've lost control of themselves. There's going to be a riot if this doesn't stop. Berksby attempts to calm them, letting them know the town of Altowa is safe now. The villagers are still angry, demanding they get the traitors. However, Berksby reasons with them, saying he needs to make sure they secure all the evidence first before the traitors are officially announced. But the next thing really shocks them, when he asks the villagers not to lay a hand on any of the traitors. However, it's because all of the convicted need to work as slaves and what awaits them will be the harshest labor beyond what any of them can imagine. The traitors cannot even choose to die, they'll be forced to work for the benefit of this world. And if they're killed here, their suffering will end. Hearing Berksby's reasoning, the villagers agree. Ivy understands just how amazing Berksby is, having calmed the villagers down so they don't end up committing crimes. I mean, I was on board with the burning, but making them be slaves till they die makes more sense. Ivy really praises Berksby saying she'd like to be just like him someday, making Latra and Shifal a little distraught, saying she doesn't need to give up her life like the captain yet. However, Berksby doesn't enjoy their banter so much. With that though, they have a one last mission for Ivy. A hall is gathered with a large group of people. Sezelk announces they're still gathering information on the members of the organization they've arrested, but they still need everyone's help. Anyone who refuses to divulge what they know about the org will be suspected of colluding with them. Barolda explains to Ivy these people were all in the vicinity of the organization's base, so they need to be investigated. They need to capture the people who are keeping watch for the org. Looking at her bag, it seems Sora is excited to work, so Ivy's just as ready as well. In the guild hall, Berksby and Agrop thank Ivy once again for helping them thwart the evil organization that's been tormenting of Tolwa for years. Berksby then hands her a summary of the recent events, which includes a list of those arrested. According to the Guild's report, it wasn't just the traitors in town who were arrested. As a result of investigations based on the documents obtained from their former base, 58 people were added to a kingdom-wide wanted list, of which 45 had been detained so far. Not even just nobility, but even the relatives of the royal family were also included. Every bit of new information they obtain is astonishing. In the last page, Ivy finds her reward for helping them out. She'll receive 15 gold tablets, or 150 Ladal. Here we go, that mice math again. 150,000 field mice worth. So if she made dried meat from 150,000 field mice, ate three a day while she traveled, with 365 days in a year, she could eat for 140 years. Outside of town, Ivy and Sora are scourging through their traps. But sadly, not a single one was tripped today. Oh, Ciel's here. Ciel simply goes back into the bushes and forces out the rodents into Ivy's traps. What a good cat. At the meat shop, the butcher admires Ivy's meats that are fresh and dressed so beautifully. The butcher offers her a wonderful sum of payment, but even better, the meat goes into tonight's celebrations, with GM Rogleaf giving a toast to celebrate the organization's destruction, and everyone is happy to give Ivy huge plates of meat, but she can't possibly eat all of it. Latra tells them to lay off, but they wonder why since he's usually handing Ivy the biggest pile of food. Barolda comes to thank Ivy, telling her Count Faltoria finally admitted to his crimes. With some members of nobility being involved, the royal capital is pretty hectic right now. Even though the bad guys have been caught, Ivy is still worried about Mila. So, Rogleaf reports that Green Gale was insignificant enough to be used as a decoy and cast aside. They didn't know anything of import and haven't committed many crimes. We even see Mila being remorseful in jail, uttering, Thank goodness we won't have to commit any more crimes. Betraying her brothers, she is apparently being given some lenience. Rogleaf also found out that Ivy and Sora were behind discovering all of the bad guys. After he looked into the list of all magic items, he became suspicious of the little orb they used. But he's fine and understands why it was so important to hide Sora's existence. At Rogleaf's request, she lets Sora out of the bag and Rogleaf is surprised to see the translucent slime. Rogleaf thanks Sora for all his hard work and Sora responds in cheer. Rogleaf then asks if Ivy would like to continue living in Otowa. He knows she's headed to the royal capital, 
but if she has no reason to, everyone would love to have her around. They'll even prepare a house for her. Ivy thinks back to when fortune teller Luba told her if she found a place she'd like to live on the way to the royal capital, there'd be no need to force herself to keep traveling. However, she'd need to find people she could trust and tell them everything. So gripping Sora close, she admits that she's starless. And everyone is surprised to hear she's a zero star monster tamer. She tells them the story of when at the age of five, her skill was checked at a church. Of how she was told that the gods had abandoned her. How she lost everything. Her parents and everyone around her became her enemies. Everyone except fortune teller Luba. When she turned eight, the village head announced that a starless would bring misfortune to the village. So she was nearly killed and ran away from the village. Back then, she was so sad and frustrated, she just wanted to live, so she ran. She was so scared because she didn't know how long she'd have to run, and didn't know where to run. And so, she kept running, all the way here. With everyone saddened by hearing Ivy's tale, Latra commends her for preserving this far. He's in tears knowing how hard it must have been all this time. Seizelk is impressed that she managed to not lose heart under those circumstances. All of them tell her they'll be there for her, causing her to weep as they remind her she'll never have to worry about her stars again. They'll even keep it a secret for her if she doesn't want people to know. With that, she puts on a smile, knowing she can leave on her journey with her heart at ease. Latra is shocked to hear she isn't going to live here, but Ivy explains up until this point, her journey had been about running away thinking if people found out she was starless, she'd be killed. But then, she met Captain Ogto and Vice Captain Villavera, who helped her despite knowing her circumstances. And these guys too, who helped her when she was being targeted, and even went along with her crazy plan. Luba had told her to learn more about the world, and because of these guys, she's gained more perspective and changed for the better. She won't run anymore, because she's perfectly fine being starless. She's going to continue her travels and find something she can do for people. The gang is all happy for her, but now it's become harder knowing they'll have to say goodbye. And apparently Rickbell is really gonna miss Sora. They celebrate hard knowing Ivy is gonna be gone. And as Ivy watches, she wonders if this is what they call happiness. With the group seeing her off, she twirls with the new magic bags they've given her, since they can carry much more and weigh a lot less. Berksby also discloses that he looked into disintegrating slimes and tells Ivy they're so weak Week, only she could have tamed one. Even a one-star tamer is too strong for slimes like Sora. If it wasn't for her taming him, he may have just disintegrated and disappeared. Making Ivy's past self acknowledge Sora may have been born just to meet her. With their final farewell, the gang tells Ivy to think of Atolwa as her home and to come back anytime. Then suddenly, Ciel jumps out of the bushes, surprising everyone. With the shock of seeing Ivy's tamed in a dondola, Shafal remarks Ivy seems more powerful than any tamer with stars he's ever seen. And with that, the three leave on their journey together. Host credits, nature is beautiful, as slimes are born throughout the forest. A little disintegrating slime comes out from a leaf as it watches the other slimes march along the path. The slime struggles because it wants to join them, but seeing other slimes just like it being easily killed off by other creatures and dissipating amongst the wind, the slime struggles to escape its meager existence. The wind eventually blows the slime away, but it's sad now that it's all alone until a certain starless monster tamer comes to find him. Ah, what a wonderful ending for now. Honestly, the part where she told Latra and the gang about her past actually made me tear up a little. I'm glad she doesn't feel the need to run anymore. I hope they continue her journey in a second season. Subscribe for more content. For now though, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.